Okay, so this class is called Legal Ways to Exit the Track Contract. And sorry, my, and we are just going to talk about, you know, different ways. We'll start with the obvious one um, and go to some of the little more obscure provisions in, in the contract. So when you do have a situation where you've got a client and they want out of the contract, and there there may be there there may be some little um some little loopholes for lack of a better word. Okay, we're going to start with the sellers outs because there are very few seller outs. Um, the as you guys probably know, um, the sorry the contract is very heavily um written in the buyer's favor. So the biggest out for the seller is if the Buyer fails to deliver the earnest money to the title company within three days of execution. So if that happens, um, the contract is not void per se. It is still a valid contract, but the seller, but the seller has the option to terminate the contract. Um, so this would be maybe a situation where you enter the contract and then on the, and, and then, you know, you're waiting day two's there, here comes day three. Now it's day four and you get another offer. You get another offer that's better. And in that situation, you could, um, terminate the contract as, as the seller, terminate the buyer because they're in default because they have the obligation to within three days deliver the earnest money and then you could go with with the the second buyer so um as i said failing to deliver it does not necessarily make it void you could the, the seller has the right to continue with the contract um even if the earnest money is late or even never delivered, um, you know, if they are wanting to move forward with it, but, but they do have that out. Okay. Next, we are going to talk about the buyer's option. Of course, the first one is the most obvious one that we, we see, and that is the option period. So, um, and guys, at any point, interrupt me, share a story, whatever you want to do. It's a lot more interesting if this is interactive. So, so, so don't hesitate. Um, uh, so, you know, we all know how this works. The um, buyer, so long as they pay the option fee within three days of execution, uh, they have the unrestricted right to terminate. So, and again, um, if they fail to pay the option fee, um, it's not, the contract is not, is not void. They just cannot, can don't have, they lose their unrestricted right to cancel. So I think we all are very familiar with that. Okay. The next has to do with the- Hey, Angela, I want to chime in real quick. Yeah, hey, Eric. Uh, good morning. Um, okay, so that failure to deliver earnest option mm -hmm. within the three days, I mean, but once they deliver it, they're good, right? Like if they deliver it, you know, an hour late or the next day or- For the if, earnest money, yes, good yeah. points. If they do deliver it and, you know, the- and the seller accepts it. Um, yes, then then they are good, right? So, so they but they but the seller it once it's delivered and the seller has been notified that it's been delivered, mm -hmm. then they're out of the they're they're out of the clear, right? I mean, right. the seller the seller to object to that would have to say, "Oh, you were late. I want out of the contract now." Right, right, okay. and to give the title company maybe a heads up. Hey, if they're going to deliver it, you know, it's on day four, day five. Um, don't accept on our behalf. Yeah. And they're out at that point is, is what? They're the out. They're the, out seller. Is that the seller is that the buyer um, is in default because they did not pay the, the earnest money within three days. And they could, they could terminate. Mm -hmm. and, okay. Can, is that, can the buyer say, I'm not signing it. I don't want to terminate. Mm. I mean, 
they well it's a termination i mean it's not a release of earnest money right so that's the okay. release of earnest money it would be the seller sending and this form it's at the very end of this presentation um are the the the, the forms that are the you know where you check there's a you know, used to the buyer terminating but there is a seller one and, and that's one of the check boxes on there so what if they delivered it and the money's held and the seller said and the buyer says, well, I don't want to terminate and I'm not releasing my earnest money. Well, they should, the, but the seller should have had a better line of communication with the title company saying they don't want the title company to accept the earnest money. Because yeah, I see I see exactly what you're saying, Eric. But so the seller can't the seller can't request and say, "Hey, I I want to terminate. You're in default of the contract, and I want to take your earnest money." Right, right. Yeah, you okay. can't take it and then claim a default. If you take it, if you if you take it, then then, you're, then you're giving them then okay okay yeah. that was that's yeah. what I was. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. That's great. Yeah. Okay. I also have a question, Angela. Um. In regards to if they are late, does that negate their option period? Because you're paying that money for your option money. Um, you're paying it for the option period. So therefore, if you're late within the time constraints that you need to deliver, the three days, mm -hmm. does that negate them having an option period? So if they're late, if they deliver the option fee, but they don't deliver the earnest money? Nope. If they both, I mean, option and earnest, I mean, it doesn't matter, but I'm just specifically talking about the option fee. If they deliver both late, mm -hmm. does that- well, They don't have an option fee. If you don't have an option fee, and that's a hard and fast rule. If you don't deliver the option fee within three days, you don't right. have an option Right, so there's no option period. period. Right. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, failure to deliver commitment and exception documents. So uh, it says within 20 days, the um, the title company, it's really the seller is supposed to furnish to the buyer, but we all know that it's the title company that is doing the legwork on this, um, the commitment, the title commitment, and the exception documents, which are the restrictive covenant covenants, um, you know, you'll you'll see these when you dig through this. These old, old. You know, if it's a it's a if it's a subdivision that was built in the 1930s. You know, you can hardly read it. It's so old. So, um, this is usually, as I said, it's in the title company's hands. But because and almost always, you know, 20 days is a very liberal um, time period for the title company to get it to the buyer. But what sometimes isn't included are all of the restrictive covenants. So um, if you are looking for, you know, an out, make sure that what was delivered to you within 20 days included all of those old, old documents and restrictions from back when, when the subdivision was, was built. So because um, if those aren't delivered, um, if those aren't delivered, um, they will. It's extended um, automatically for 15 days. But then, if if then it isn't given after that 15 days, it um, that then it becomes an out for the buyer. Okay, uncured title objections. Um, if you guys were on the call the Monday morning meeting um, last Monday, Zareen spoke to this um, about the objections. So, um, and as she, were most of you guys on that? Probably were, yeah. Um, that, you know, this is when you put an, an activity, you know, single family use really doesn't mean anything, but if there's something you want to do specifically with that property, and you're you're worried that there may be um, restrictions on it, um, either, you know, maybe it's a setback line, maybe you need to, you know, build a house that's, you know, a certain size, and you've got a ratio of, of the 
structure to the lot size or you want to build a pool and there may be an easement. So let's say it's a pool and you put um, construction of in-ground pool. Um, and then you you get the survey back and it shows a big old, you know, abandoned sewer or something going through the middle of the backyard, meaning you can't do it. Then you have the then you have the right to to object. And if it's not curable, which like in a situation with an easement or an abandoned sewer line or something, it wouldn't be, then the seller, um, they have a 15 day period in which they can cure it. But after that, the buyer has the right to terminate. So this is important. And, you know, I think we're going to probably do some more. I think Zurian's developing a whole class, um, and that she's doing in conjunction with an underwriter of momentous titles. And, and that's going to be given, I think, the second Thursday in September. So we'll dig kind of deeper into this and some of the other title, um, you know, specifics having to do with title um, in that class. Okay, MUDs and PID. So a MUD is a you statutory tax district um and uh, usually having to do with water and drainage and flood control so and the texas water code requires the seller to deliver to buyer a notice relating to it prior to final execution of the contract okay so with the mud and there is not a trek form right now for the mud. So if you're selling a house that's in a mud, um, muds are usually listed in the tax rolls. So you can find this out. Um, like I know there's a lot of muds, um, like Trophy Club has a mud, um, Forney has a mud, and you can look in the tax rolls, go to the county tax um, files online, and it, it'll have a line item just like it does for school and hospital and all that. So if you think you may be, then you need to find out. It's your job as the seller's agent to um, find out if it's in a MUD and then find the MUD. Um, and online, if the MUDs all have their own websites and they have forms online and that relate to the tax rate and fees and indebtedness. So, and that needs to be delivered to the buyer prior to, prior to the final execution. So this is a pretty big out, you know, cause I think a lot of people, especially if, you know, it's not your bread and butter to do transactions in these areas where there are muds and it can kind of, and you're not familiar with it, um, that if it's not, you're not in compliance, it, it's a big, it's a big out for the buyer. Okay. And similarly, a PID, a public improvement district, um, they have to give notice at well, I'm sorry, they have to give notice as well. Um, and it says the notice will be attached to the contract. And there is an actual form, a truck form, pretty new truck form. It's right at two years old. Um, that you need to that that you need to um deliver with it. And so a PID is a public improvement district. And these aren't necessarily in the tax rolls, but on the city websites, you can find this out. And even a lot of these are in so, sort of the new booming suburbs like Salina and Prosper, places like that. But there are also parts of Dallas, Plano, Fort Worth. And like in Dallas, like Uptown, parts of Uptown are in a PID. So if you're selling a condo in Uptown, um, it, it's in a PID. So do, do go to the city to the city website and, and look to see, and you can even plug in like in the Dallas one, you can plug in an address and, and it'll show you if it's if it's in the PID. And if so, you need to attach this form um, or else it's an out for the buyer. Does that make sense? Yes. I have a question real fast on that, Angela, because this actually just came up um, mm -hmm. and un totally unbeknownst to me because Frisco is so built out now, but Panther Creek um, apparently had a pit. My mm, sellers had zero idea about it. Um, and it just, for whatever reason, it came up. So 
um, once you find out about it, like if, so is that, would the buyers have an out if this form is not signed or if the sellers went ahead and just paid the rest of the PID because you can, you know, a PID ends, it's not like a mud where it's just ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, if they pay it off and then there is no financial obligation to the PID, do you still need that form? Oh, so there is a PID, but there's no financial obligation? No, there is a, I'm saying if they paid it off, they paid off that financial obligation mm -hmm. because it was, it was like two, it was something silly just because it's completely established. Right. But whatever. It was like for 20 years, this, you had to pay two, 250, blah, blah, blah. So if they paid off the financial obligation, is there still yeah. a PID? I think they do. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't say, you know, that it, it doesn't limit it to something that, you know, has the payment. So it just says if it's in a public improvement district. So I think it's broad enough, but um, that, that's an interesting distinction. So that form should be f signed even after late discovery? So like late discovery in terms of your transaction, right? Yeah, so like we're closing late. next week. I should still have this signed. Yeah. Um, if the property owner must give notice as written. Yeah, I, I would go ahead and do it. Yeah, I would do it. Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks. You are welcome, Lori. Okay, Tidewaters, um, this doesn't really apply to North Texas, um, but there's a similar notice um, if you are selling a property, if you were selling something in Galveston, um, which probably hopefully you aren't because you probably don't have geographical competency there, um, and propane gas, um, if you're in a propane gas district, so if you're doing something kind of out in the in the country, it may be that, and there's an addendum, a track addendum, um, noting that as well. So, um, two other notices. Okay, seller's disclosure. Um, you know, we try to make it our best practice here at Briggs Freeman Sotheby's International Realty to have our seller's disclosure um, completed by the sellers and uploaded into ReChat and optimally uploaded into the transaction desk of Netris. Um, immediately so there can be no um, so it is clearly given to the buyer prior to execution and you can check that first box saying that the buyer has received notice um, but if they haven't received notice um, then you put in the number of days in which they can the seller has to deliver it from buyer but um but let's say this is the situation. You don't have it on day one of the contract, you know, but they say within, within you know, three days we'll deliver it. You get it, you know, you, you get it on day three. Then you have seven days and the buyer has seven days upon receipt to, to terminate the contract because of the, because of the notice. Um, so, and, and again, so that's a very broad out. And even if there is an update to it, to the seller's disclosure, um, that can be deemed as triggering that seven day, um, that, that seven days again. So um, again, hopefully you guys on the sell side are doing everything on the front end, but it's, it's a big out to be aware of if you're on the buy side and haven't received the seller's disclosure. Okay, lender required repairs. Um, this is if um, there's, uh, this is probably a lot more common with FHA and VA loans, but we'll also see it with conventional um, too, um, when the lender says we're not going to close unless certain repairs are done. So, you know, VHA and FHA can be, you know, relatively small things like peeling paint, wood rot, um, wood destroying insects. And then the big things that could be with conventional too would be foundation or roof are usually the main things. Um, and it says that if the parties do not agree to pay for the lender required repairs, um, the contract will terminate and the, and the money will be refunded 
will be refunded to buyer. And then if, and then another um, section of this provision is that if the cost of the lender required repairs are more than 50, or I'm sorry, more than 5% of the sales price, the buyer may terminate the contract and the earnest money may be refunded to buyer. So even if the seller is willing to pay in that situation, um, the buyer still has the right to terminate. So they may just be, you know, scared that it's a lemon of a house or whatever. Um, so this one isn't super common, but again, something to be, um, to keep on your radar. Okay. Next is, sorry guys. Okay, um, failure to complete repairs. Um, as we know that now there's a lot more, there's a lot more language that has been added, you know, kind of in a couple of different, in a couple of different renditions of the contract through, through the last couple of years about um, kind of amping up the seller's obligation to, to do the repairs and, and, you know, used to, it just said they would do it. And that meant the seller could, you know, put on his DIY um, hat and do it himself. And it said, you know, someone who's licensed has to do it. And then now um, it says that they have to provide documentation and scope of work and the, the warranties. So if the, you know, if the, inspection showed the need of repairs and you negotiated for the seller to do it and it comes to your your walk through the day before closing and just that's and they haven't done it all right um, with the right documentation that could be an out for for the buyers um, to to get out of the contract so um, next would be um sorry guys okay general warranty d this is kind of obscure um but it says in here um under b1 um that the seller shall execute one of sellers obligations at closing is to execute and deliver a general warranty deed conveying title to the property so just as a refresher, a general warranty deed is a deed um, that guarantees clear title through the from the beginning of time um, of the property, okay? Whereas a special warranty deed um, is lesser. It guarantees clear title only during the seller's ownership period. Now, granted, you know, 99% of our transactions have proper, have title insurance along with it. So you are getting a, even, even if you're getting a special warranty deed, your title insurance is going to go all the way back in time on it. Um, so really you have the same level of protection I'm um, getting as a buyer getting a special warranty deed in conjunction with um, a title policy, but the way the contract is written, it says that the the seller shall deliver a general warranty deed. So, and then there's some situations where a where a general warranty deed can never be delivered. For instance, if it were ever foreclosed upon somewhere in the history of the property, you can't give a general warranty deed. It's a special warranty deed. So um, this is something, and most people never take a second look at this provision. They, they just sign it. But really it is something you should probably keep in mind because if, you were selling a property and you knew that, you know, 20 years ago, you know, you bought it from, you, you bought it out of foreclosure. Um, it's only, they're only going to be able to grant a special warranty deed. So it would be smart to change that to, um, a special warranty deed because 
technically a buyer could claim that the seller, you know, this would all kind of come up very late in the game, like at the closing table, probably um, that the, that a, a special warranty deed and not a general warranty deed was being delivered. Does that make sense? You guys. Hello? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Failure to close. Um, failure to close. Um, the clo so as we know, we put on in a date here. Um, and it says honor before. Um, and we also know that a large percent of the time, um, usually because of lender related um, delays, you know, sometimes the state is missed. And the question is, what happens um, at that time? So is the is the buyer in default if if they're going to be a day or two days late um, being able to close? Um, we also know that this paragraph is does not have a time is of the essence clause, um, like some things like the delivery of the option money does. So there it has been, you know, determined in prior court cases that if you are a little bit late and what's a little bit, um, two days, probably yes. A week, kind of not sure yet. Um, then what happens is is the buyer in, in default you know uh, so obviously the best thing to do is if you realize that you know it's get, you're going to be you're going to be late because of the lender or, you know something is to try to uh, try to get an amendment to change the closing date to push that out but if a seller wanted to be you know want it to be difficult, maybe they have a backup that's higher waiting in the wings, then, you know, they could be, they wouldn't be willing to extend the closing date and, and hope that you miss it. I mean, it probably would become, you know, a litigious situation um, on, you know, whether the, if the buyer is really, you know, using their best efforts to perform. Does that make sense? Yep. Yes. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> hey, Angela, I want to, I want to jump in real quick and I share a little, uh, recent situation I had yes. run into. Um, I was on the list side and we had uh, a buyer come in very aggressive up early. They wrote a contract that we would have seen probably a couple of years ago. We, we still see it some, but not as much. It was, you know, waiving every single contingency in the contract possible. Um, and uh, I represented the seller on relocation. Um, so relocation had granted them their 10 day, uh, you know, option period to do mm -hmm. whatever they needed. Right. So um, anyways, fast forward as we kind of get through the option period, uh, the, the agent had let me know verbally on a call that they were going to be sending some something over after them, you know, telling us they weren't going to be doing inspections, yada, yada. But anyhow, so they send over a, a you know, a, a request of some things that um, that they had decided they were going to ask for. And in lieu of those, they asked for a, a fairly large amount, um, a dollar amount credit. Um, but when they sent that over, they were about two hours past their deadline. OK, a uh, 5 p.m. deadline on their option period. And, um, and so I went ahead and, and obviously spoke to relocation. We went through everything. Relocation had decided that, you know, uh, you know, no, we're not going to do that. Um, they had asked for a, a, a one day extension, um, because of lending situation, because of their lender, what you know, needed one more day, but, but they tied the close date, the, the extension, the one day extension, they tied the 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 uh the credit as one amendment right so they kind of tie they wanted to try to tie down the seller and say oh well you know so i said well you know we need to do this separately you know um we're happy to extend the closing 
but they're not going to agree to these uh, repairs or this this credit. Um, so anyways, fast forward, it was a really quick close. So fast forward to um, a couple days or a day before closing and the the buyer's agent said, well, uh, my seller or my buyer wants wants these this credit. And I said, well, I'm sorry, the seller's not going to give it. Um, and the buyer said, well, they better. And we, I said, well, okay, well, they're, they're not going to, um, if you have a, a, another proposal, I'd be happy to, to go back to them. But as it stands, they're, they're not, they're not going to, you know, do that. So, um, so the extension of the close never got signed on because they would never send over a separate amendment for the close date. So anyways, kind of to your point that you just talked about, you know, that date, what does that close date mean, right? So they didn't close on the day they said they were going to close, right? So that didn't happen. Uh, the seller was still performing. They were ready to close to do their part. Well, then they did not close on the next day. So they ended up being two days late on, on closing while they are still trying to hold the seller hostage on asking for this credit. Well, on the day of closing or whatever day they decided they were going to close, let's mm -hmm. just say they showed up to title and sat at the title company, told told the escrow officer that was closing the deal for them that um, they were waiting for this uh, amendment that we were supposed to be sending over to them. So they were not going to sign until they received this. Well, they conveyed a message to the, you know, to title that, that like we had agreed to this. Mm. Well, when I called title to check to see what was going on, you know, they tell me, oh, well, they're waiting for that amendment. I said, well, there's no amendment. I don't know what you're talking about. She goes, oh, really? Well, they're telling me you're sending this amendment. So they said at the title company in the, in the, in the lobby and said, we're not going to sign until we receive this. And we're just going to sit here. So they sat at the title company and just sat there and sat there and they got there at like noon and they sat there all afternoon. Um, and of course, titles like panicking, like what in the world, like what's going on? And I'm like, I don't know, like they want this money and the seller's not giving it to them. So anyway, so I share that story because, you know, then fast forward to, of course, you know, I'm, I jump in and of course, you know, our job is to get this thing closed. Right. So I'm doing everything that I can to coach up the seller on like the market and look, things have changed and things are slow. Like I know this isn't right, but you know, I still recommend that we try to find a way to get this done because I really don't know what they're going to do. And the, 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 the buyer's agent, they had basically started threatening that, they they weren't going to terminate. They were not going to release the earnest money and they want the house. But the only way they're buying this house is if they get this credit, bottom line. And they're just going to sit there and wait. So, um, you know, they probably got lucky that it was that it was part of relocation because they just wanted to get the, the, the get it moved. Um, but, you know. So anyways, you know, fast forward to, you know, they ended up offering them, they offered them to kind of split the difference. They said, no, we're going to wait for the amount we want. And then, so they end up giving them a little bit more. Um, and I felt really bad for the seller. They got put in a really, really bad spot. Um, but I share that story to say, okay, when that was the first experience that I had had and I, the office, the S, the title company, after we had spoken about it and they're like, well, the lady said, well, I've been doing this for 25 years. I've never had anyone do that to, to me either. So what would have been the option for the seller or, or what could have happened in that particular situation if 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 the seller just wouldn't have given them anything at all? Um, and, and throughout that process, of course, you know, everybody gets really emotional, you know, and, and what the other agent on the other side kept telling me was, Oh, Eric, these these dates don't mean anything. The option date doesn't mean anything. The close date doesn't mean anything. You you can ask anybody, any attorney. These dates don't mean anything. I said, Wow, I don't know where you went to school for uh, real estate, but that's new to me. Um, not the way that we do business, but okay. So anyhow, I share that to just you know maybe a lesson learned for all of us. But you know maybe I'll let you know you kind of tell me or tell us kind of what you think. 
our options or what we what could have been done for a seller in that situation and what could have happened to the buyer. Right, right. Well, I disagree with his statement, um, part of his statement about the option. The option period matters. It's a time is of the essence clause, right? It's a hard, it's a hard three days, right? Correct. Yep. I, I, well, it would delivery and then it's over when it's over. I mean, if it's over at five, it's over at five and five oh two. Sorry, you know, I think we we all know that. That totally matters. Um, so if your people would have just, you know, played hardball and sat there, it would have probably had to go to the title company, if there was a dispute, they wouldn't have released the earnest money, right? So if, if you know the, if your seller said we're not going to close, we're not going to, we're not going to give in, then, and and the buyer obviously wasn't gonna wasn't gonna wasn't gonna back down. So I think in that situation, I mean, it would be a dispute for earnest earnest money, you know, at the title company. And we all know the title company is that might like to make decisions about things like that, right? They're the neutral party. So in reality, I think it probably everyone would lawyer up, you know? Yeah. And, and fight it. I mean, I think that that's unfortunately that's that's the answer. Yeah. That's how these things yeah. play out. So so probably Eric was smart to go ahead and get them to pay something to get make this thing close. Sounds like it probably because if the markets changed and then they would have lawyer fees and you know and just you know trying to get it done and and move on. I mean, they, yeah, this that was that was a crazy story. But yeah, I mean, I basically <laughs> shared I shared with the seller like you know this is. We don't agree with it. This is 100% wrong. Yeah. Um, I, I, they probably should really have it stuck to them, to be honest with you. Uh, but do you really want to go through that fight, right? You're going to, you know, you're going to pay all these fees. You're going to do all this stuff and you're probably going to win and you're right, but you're still going to lose in the end. Right. Because it you're still going to, it's going to end up costing you. Yeah. And then, it's going to end up costing you more than. Mm -hmm. you know, than what it's going to take to probably get them to satisfy them at this point. But, you know, like how unfortunate that is. And like, I don't know, I look at that and I go, my goodness, like, is there some correction that needs to be done in our contracts that, that help protect someone in a situation like that? Because why wouldn't every buyer try that? Right. Right. No, well, you're, you're right. Well, yeah. question. Um, and look, technically though, Okay, let's say the seller just said, hey, the market's hot. I can go get somebody else. I know that's not true necessarily in this case, but just exploring it technically. And the seller said, great, then we're not going to sell it to you. And I don't know, the title, you, you can leave your money at the title company and, uh, and we're going to move on. I mean, the seller could just move on, couldn't they technically? Yeah, they could. Um, there would be a claim um, that that title company would not close another deal, right? Knowing that there was a dispute. Um, they could potentially, you know, relist it, put it back on the market um, and put a different title company, right? Now, this the buyer could, they could put a lien on it. You know, they could put a lien on the property, you know, for, for that earnest money. So there's that as a risk. Really? I don't know. You can't legislate stupid. I mean, my God. <laughs> well, what title told what title told me was they would they would only hold it for 15 days and then they would they would turn it over. They would let let it go. And it turns over to I don't know what the legal term was, but I think they turn it over to I don't know what they I don't remember what they even called it. Mm -hmm. um, and she said at that point, she goes at that point, we're, we're out. She goes, you know, we that's our way of not being tied to it. Yes the earnest money, I guess, gets tied up at that point, but, um, until it's, till it's, uh, agreed upon legally right, at that right, point, yeah. but tie, that's the way title gets out of it and moves on and it's off their plate. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. That's a, that's a fascinating story. So. Yeah. And it was really unfortunate because I guess lesson learned for all of us, but like, you know, when I looked back through the, 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 the sequence of events, it was it was a very clear cut situation to where it was a buyer that was 100% taking advantage of a seller 
by being their friend and being a neighbor and, oh, we want to stay in the neighborhood and reaching out to the owner directly because the owner posted it on their Facebook page, yada, yada, yada. But it was one of those, like they were so over the top with all these sequence of events and then wrote this contract that almost didn't make sense in our market anymore and then did that, right? right? It was almost like they knew that they were going to do that. Yeah, yeah, very connected. And their agent was sketchy, sounds like. Yeah. yeah, I've already, I've already, I've already turned the agent's name in to maybe not to, maybe not to be on our radar at Briggs, Freeman, Sotheby's. Interesting. All right. Crazy. Uh, that is crazy. Okay, one more thing before we move on to the addendum. Um, casualty loss. So if part of the property is damaged or destroyed by fire or other casualty um, during the contract period, we had a bunch of these situations four years ago when the um, when the tornado came through Dallas. And then again, during the, what do they call it? The snowpocalypse or whatever, um, um, a year or so after that. So what happens if something really detrimental happens to the property? The buyer has three options. They can terminate the contract and get the earnest money back. They can extend performance um, for up to 15 days, um, hoping that the seller can get the house in you know, decent shape by then. Or they can accept the property in its damaged condition with an assignment of insurance proceeds. Um, but the catch to that one is that the insurance carrier um, has to be in agreement with, with that assignment. And that is usually not the case. So um, that is just something um, that, you know, with these changing weather patterns can indeed um, happen. Okay, looking at the contract addenda, we'll look at the big one first, the third-party financing addendum. Uh, I think you guys know that there are two distinct um, approvals or contingencies in this addendum. There is the buyer approval and there is the property approval, and they're totally separate from one another. So buyer approval um, means that it has to do with the buyer, their credit, their their credit, their income, their job. And so if you're making the contract, if you're financing and making it contingent upon upon, you know, having the the lender, you know, get the buyer approved, um, you put that number of days and um if they terminate, they have to provide a letter from from the from the lender saying that, you know, they just aren't making the, you know, they don't have the ratio or whatever it is to buy it, then the buyer gets the earnest money back. So next to the option period, this is probably the out that we see the most option. I'm sorry, the most often. Um, and then the next one is the property approval. And um, that is t again totally separate from the buyer and usually takes place after the contingency period under buyer approval has passed. Um, this is the buyer determining if it satisfies the lender's underwriting requirements. And this normally has to do with appraisal, um, but can also do with lender required repairs. Um, so the provision says that if not later than three days before closing, um, the buyer provides seller a written statement from the lender um, showing that it did not you know, meet the underwriting uh, approval, aka did not appraise, um, they can get out. And this we see quite a bit. And I cannot tell you how many times I have received calls from agents saying, okay, we're supposed to close tomorrow and we just got the appraisal back and, you know, it's $50,000 lower, you know, what, what can I do? And at that point, once it's that three days before closing has passed, nothing, the buyer is required to come up with extra funds to make the loan to value ratio, you know, had the appraisal had come, that low appraisal had come in, you know, four days before closing, then the buyer could have either, you know, canceled, terminated the contract 
or what often happens is that the parties will sometimes negotiate, you know, um, if it's a $50,000 difference, difference, maybe, you know, they lower the price by 25 and the buyer brings, you know, some extra to closing, but very, but just a uh, warning, always keep your eye on, on that date. If you have a appraisal that, you know, is, has not come in and you're getting close to that closing date, you know, try to amend the contract um, because, you know, it's a big risk. It, it's, it's, it's a nice out that your buyers have if, if they've, you know, done the third party financing addendum and have not done the appraisal waiver addendum. So as we know, the appraisal waiver addendum, it limits um, that property approval section of the third party financing addendum. Um, so, but if you do, you know, section one of it, you know, that nullifies the property approval contingency for the buyer. But if you check number two, um, partial waiver, you know, you can do an amount um, just to give you some protection, some kind of a, a base um, so that if it's lower than that base, um, you can still cancel um, under that. And then the paragraph three of the appraisal waiver amendment is gives the buyer the right to terminate even if it makes the loan to value ratio so this would be a, a section that you would check when the buyer is putting down a large sum of money like maybe it's a million dollar property and they're putting down 500 in financing but they get an appraisal just kind of for their own um, peace of mind and it comes in at you know, let's say they put, they want to make sure they're not making a bad business decision, even though they're going to get the loan. And if it's below that amount, so million dollar property, let's say they put in, you know, 900 and it comes in at 850, then they would in this situation have the ability to, to cancel the contract, terminate the contract, even though they could still move forward with the loan. Okay. The Backup contract addendum. Um, this is what is used if you are, if you miss out on the property you want, but you want to be first in line in case something happens to that first contract. Um, in that ad backup addendum, there is this period that says if the buyer has the unrestricted right to terminate the backup contract. Um, the time for giving notice of termination begins on the effective date of the backup contract, continues after the amended effective date, and ends upon the expiration of buyer's unrestricted right to terminate the backup contract. So what does that mean? That means that if you are putting in a backup contract, um, you should always put in a... Um, you should always put in an option period um, because and pay that option fee. And I know a lot of times when you guys do that, um, and I have language, um, you don't want to, your buyer doesn't want to put down a lot of money in option fee and earnest money because, you know, it's relatively slim chance that they're going to, you know, get out of the backup position and actually become the primary contract. So I have language that says, you know, that you can we can put in special provision saying that you know you put in like ten dollars each for now and then when it becomes primary you change it to the normal amount like you know 200 and then one two hundred dollars let's say for an option fee and you know one percent for earnest money so but it's key even if you're putting in a nominal a nominal amount during the backup period um, to pay that because that makes this period, this provision effective. So, so long as you pay that original option fee, um, then you, then while you're in backup, the whole time you're in backup, the buyer, the backup buyer can terminate the contract. Um, so they've got an option period throughout that whole period. And then if they become primary, 
then they have the normal amount. So once they put seven days or five days in, in for, you know, once they're primary, and then they would do their inspections and could, um, could terminate it, you know, just like a normal option period. But paying that option period, that option fee during the backup is, is what is key to trigger that. Okay, a um, couple of other things. Um, this is um, the first page of the one to four contract leases and lease addenda um, that, uh, you know, if, if you do have um, a lease, um, if you have a, you, you know, you now have to provide a copy of it. And um, if it's a residential lease, then the seller has three days to deliver a copy of the lease to the buyer and then a negotiated number of days after they receive it um, during which the buyer can terminate um, right there. And then similarly on the fixture lease, um, with the fixture lease, the seller has five days to deliver a copy of the fixture lease. And that could be like for a security system that is leased or for a solar panel. Um, those are kind of the two main ones. So they've got five days to deliver a copy of the lease to the buyer. And after that, the after they receive it, the buyer has seven days in which they can terminate upon receipt of that. And for the natural resources lease, a mineral lease, um, the seller has three days to deliver the lease and then a negotiated number of days to terminate. And that's, there's not an actual addendum, track addendum, like there are for residential and fixture leases. Um, but it's, it's just taken, that language is just taken care of in the body of the one to four contract. All right. Um, okay. Next is the, um, HOA addendum. So this is when you're selling a property using the one to four contract, but it's in a mandatory subdivision. Um, this seller has blank number of days um, right there to deliver the subdivision information, which includes restrictions, bylaws, and the rules of the subdivisions, along with the resale certificate. Um, okay, and then after receipt of that, the buyer has three days to terminate. So, um, so it's always good if you um, are selling something in a mandatory subdivision. If you try to get all of those documentations documents on the front end, then you can do box three. Um, which says the buyer has received um, the subdivision information. Um, and then if they don't require an updated resale certificate, then you're good and you don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about, you know, this period of cancel, is it cancel, this period where the buyer can cancel. Um, otherwise, if there is a resale certificate that needs to be updated, they have, um, 10 days um, after receipt of that when they can cancel. So back two years ago when things were so crazy hot and people were waiving inspections, waiving everything, waiving options, a lot of people would kind of use this provision and the similar one that's in the condo contract um, as their option period. Um, they would say no option, but then you know, knowing that this provision was there, it did basically serve the same effect um, where a buyer has the right to cancel because once the buyer receives the subdivision information, um, you know, they can cancel for any reason. It doesn't have to be because of something, um, a provision that they don't like in, in, the, in the subdivision information. Okay, one more thing I'd like to point out about this contract, um, this contract addendum is B, material changes. It says if the seller becomes aware of any changes to the subdivision information, seller shall promptly give notice to the buyer. And then they, after receipt of that notice, the buyer has 10 days in which they could can cancel. So let's say, you know, you only meet twice a year, you know, for the homeowners association and 
and the subdivision information, you know, hasn't been been changed since the last meeting. But last last week there was a meeting and they made this big change saying, you know, no, no more short term rentals in in our subdivision. And, you know, you know about it um, or deemed to have known about it, then even though you've given it's not reflected in the subdivision information, um, which is the most current um, because the new ones haven't been, you know, piped up yet. Um, because you know about it, you're required to give um, that information about the material change um, to the buyer because that can make a difference, for instance, on the um, short-term rentals on whether they want to move forward with it. Okay. Um, the condo contract um, has similar information um, to that's built into the contract as opposed to on the HOA um, addendum that's used with single family homes and HOAs. Um, for condo HOAs, um, you have a blank, a blank number of days um, to, to give the resale certificate um, to the buyer. And after that, they have seven, the buyer has seven days um, to terminate. So a little bit different time period um, between HOAs and condos, but um, the same the same effect. Um, looking at default, you know, we were, um, so if the buyer is in default or either side is in default, the buyer may, uh, the other party may enforce specific performance or seek other relief as may be provided by law or both, or they may terminate the contract and receive the earnest money as liquidated damages and, and as a release. So as we were talking about in Eric's situation, you know, um, sometimes parties won't agree to release the earnest money. And that's when you get into, you know, these other situations. And usually, and rarely do they actually go all the way to litigation, but usually the parties, you know, will hire an outside attorney and try to, you know, pressure the other side to, to um, release or at least compromise part of, um, you know, the earnest money in a contract dispute. Um, just a reminder to always have the notice um, provision filled out. So when you do have to give notice that you are wanting to, your client is wanting to terminate, you know where to send it. So, um, and then we mentioned before using these forms, this is the notice of termination, of buyer's termination of contract. And that you use, you know, when many of these um, provisions we've talked about today um, are being used to as the reason to terminate. Um, and if there's a different one, you have the ability to write into Section 8. And that there is also a seller's notice of termination of contract form. But um, since there aren't as many outs in the contract for the seller as there are for the buyer, Really, the only one that is actually set forth is that the buyer had when the buyer has failed to deliver the earnest money within the required time. Um, and if you know you are trying to get out of the contract um, and get the earnest money released, um, all title companies will require both parties to sign this. Unless most title companies, not all, but most, will let you just do the termination for the option period um, during the option period without a signed release. But if it's any of the other provisions in the buyer's termination, they re require that everyone, um, the seller, the buyer, and their agents um, sign off on this release of earnest money and release. And that, my friends, is it. Um, any questions? No? I did I miss the beginning. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Lori. Sorry, I'm sorry. I did miss the beginning QR code. Um, yeah, let me go back to that. Getting there, getting there. So thank y'all for, yeah, here, I'll keep this up for a few minutes. Thank y'all so much for coming today. And if you have any questions, um, give me a call. I have a question, Angela, the new seller's disclosure coming. Uh, May yes, yes. Can mm -hmm. they do an update to the seller's disclosure? Do they, they need can. to 
And I'm sending that out today. I spoke mm -hmm. about it at the Turtle Creek Huddle yesterday. So mm -hmm. they should do um they should do an update. And I actually typed out language um, and I'm gonna send an actual PDF so they can just I just kind of recreated the language and they can send it to their clients to check the boxes. Mm -hmm. You would do that if they are not already under contract and it's listed. If they are under contract already, okay. Don't right. do it um, right. because it only applies to contracts. The new change about the we're talking about the new changes to the um, seller's disclosure that become effective September 1st. And that's for contracts executed September 1st or after. So right. what you don't want to do is that if it's already under contract, if let's say it went under contract August the 15th. Right. It's fine. And you don't want to make that change because then that seven day that seven day period for delivery of seller's disclosure because of the, the change starts to run again. So you just want to do it. If there is a con a listing that you already have a seller's disclosure on and it's not already under contract. Right. Yes. But so yeah, you'll be seeing that from me later today. Okay, great. Thanks. You are welcome. Well, I hope you guys have a 